All right, so we're uh, back doing a, our periodic podcast for uh, Hebrew in the winter. So we're on to our infinitive absolute today. Um, today we're still in that world of infinitives. Last day was infinitive constructs, um, but now we're looking at a bit of a different sort, a uh, different sort being the infinitive absolute, and we'll see there's differences in form as well as in function. So we're kind of wading deeper into the verbal system um, and also getting into some matters of syntax. So we'll see what we can do here. Now for us in English, when we're dealing in infinitives, this might seem like splitting hairs for us because we don't technically uh, differentiate between, um, you know, what we might call a uh, construct or an absolute in the infinitives. But in Hebrew, these forms are, are quite distinct and their functions matter. Um, they, they differ markedly in a sentence. So we've got a bit of a the thing I want to pause here and think about, um, even if it means some challenges for us in finding an approximate in English at first glance. So uh, the roadmap for today then is we're going to get into these infinitive absolutes. These again are uh, verbal nouns in the same way that our infinitive constructs were. Uh, we'll Try to start with a definition, um, but because Hebrew doesn't quite maintain, uh, or English doesn't maintain a difference between these as much as Hebrew, we might try to get at this definition by a bit of a negative negative definition. That is by understanding it uh, over and against what we learned last week for the infinitive construct. Uh, then we'll kind of tour through um, three or four major uh, aspects of their syntactical function as well as look briefly at their form, which is really just one form. It's not a full paradigm. So that should give us a handle on many of the things that uh, Ross is dealing with this week. He gives us a short explanation of what the infinitive absolute is. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you another list here that, again, defines it based off of what we learned last week uh, for the infinitive construct. To kind of build off of what we know, and I want to do this by drawing on a helpful discussion uh, of this this form from a really uh, well known, well used, and of uh, definitely a good Hebrew textbook to get a hold of if you're moving on. Um, this is by um, Bruce Walkey and uh, Michael O'Connor. It's a second year and beyond, I guess, syntax. Uh, it's about the size of a phone book, but it's worth uh, worth the read at least as a reference resource. Um, they'll map out all sorts of things about biblical Hebrew syntax and have some really helpful discussions of items such as this that are a little bit foreign to us from uh, from an English perspective. So. I've tried to condense their larger discussion down into a handful of points here that might be helpful for us. So this is their uh, discussion, uh, page 583. Many things they draw attention to here would be helpful. Uh, the first one is that we'll see it's really only the infinitive absolute can regularly, t regularly take the place of a verb. Uh, now, last day we looked at infinitive constructs. I think what we saw is most often uh, their action is in some way um, set up in relation to a main verb in the sentence. So we saw, for example, they could communicate the result or intention of a finite verb. Um, they could say something about the origins or the inception of an action uh, that's about to occur, or they even complemented uh, the action of another, another verbal form. We also saw that they could play into that time aspect based on another verbal marker like evolved consecutive. So in many ways, the infinitive construct, uh, it's a, a verbal noun, but the verbal qualities we talked about last day um, are always in association to a, another verb. Now, we'll see that the infinitive absolute can operate all on its own uh, and stand in for some verbal ideas. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but something we can see a bit of a differentiation on. So that'll be item number one. Uh, numbers two and three um, kind of go together. The infinitive construct, uh, we can build upon it. That's kind of a helpful thing to perhaps remember to differentiate the two. The construct, you can add prepositions. You can also add pronominal suffixes. The absolute, uh, infinitive absolute, cannot handle either of those. So for the infinitive construct, um, those prepositions like we saw for b, l, and k, those were very helpful and instructive for determining their syntactical function. The infinitive absolute simply won't take those prepositions. Rather, its function in a sentence is going to be determined by other items in the clause, the sentence, context, whatever the case may be. Similarly, for the pronominal suffix uh, on the infinitive construct, we saw that those um, would could, I guess, indicate subject or objects of the clause. Again, the infinitive absolute will stand independently, and it won't take um, pronominal suffix. So that's one thing that will very will stand out very clearly um, in between these two in a, in a sentence or in a context. Uh, okay, what's next? Um, kind of building off of that. 
if the infinitive construct could take those suffixes to indicate a subject, um, well, how will the infinitive absolute do this? Um, it will rely on a subject that's stated elsewhere in the sentence. So this could be an inflected verb. We know that our verbs are perfect and imperfect, for example, are inflected for person, gender, and number. And that inflection includes uh, who the subject is. Um, the infinitive absolute will, will point to that. Um, it could also point to a pronoun or a noun in the sentence that is a subject, but it will never have um, a suffix to indicate that. The last point here is less about um, their, their form and their function than it is just, just about running the numbers on some, some statistics. Uh, which will you see more frequently? Um, you'll see a lot more infinitive constructs in the Bible. Uh, for example, uh, I did a quick search and tallied, let's see, 6,680, um, give or take a few, uh, infinitive constructs throughout the, uh, the entire Hebrew Bible. Again, a quick search in the Hebrew Bible for infinitive absolutes. It's around 872, 875, definitely under 1,000. So you've got about uh, six or seven times more infinitive constructs in the Hebrew Bible than absolutes. So that, I think, um, isn't in the same way a definition as we've been handling definitions, but gives us a sense of what are these things, how do they function, and how they look different, perhaps, than infinitive constructs. Most often, the infinitive you'll find statistically will be uh, infinitive construct, but the infinitive absolutes that we do have uh, are important, and they have differences uh, formally and in their function. So why don't we move into that now? Here's our, uh, our master paradigm. Again, um, the form we're dealing with is, is standard, it's fixed, it's not inflected for person, gender, or number. So here, like we saw last week, we don't have to have a full paradigm, it's really just one form. Uh, the form that we're dealing with is uh, going to be the, the hallmark will be at this point with a comet and then a holom vav. So once again, uh, we are only dealing with one form. Here would be pa code, pa code, that form there on the left. One of the advantages of the infinitive absolute is because we aren't adding anything onto the front or at back of it, like prepositions or suffixes. We don't have to worry about any um, patterns for reduction that can happen, like we had to worry about for um, our infinitive constructs. You'll be seeing this form pa code quite consistently for our strong verbs. The only variation we may see is, if you remember way back when we talked about um, uh, plenty spelling, full spelling, or defective spelling, and that had to do with where we might see certain um, long vowels um, take their, their shorter, uh, shorter vowel forms in some forms, uh, and that can happen here. We could see pack code with a holom vav. We could also see pack code with just simply a holom. The important thing is that comets will be our diagnostic indicator, and then an O-class vowel, we could say, in that second position. Since we talked a little bit about weak verbs last day, and we're going to try and pick up on um, a few of these things from time to time so we don't have to spend uh, uh, the whole month at the end of the course doing them, we could look at a few things here as well. Remember, our weak verbs... Um, are, are verbs that have a guttural or rish in one of the three um, root consonants. So we've got a couple of examples here that we could look at. Um, our strong pattern will actually work for most forms of the weak verb, except for two key exceptions to that rule. The first example we're looking at here uh, comes from the verb ra'a, rish, aleph, he. And what we see happen there is what we saw could happen um, with many three hay verbs, as you remember from last day. For some three hay verbs, that hay will drop off uh, right before the whole involve. And what we end up with is ra'o. And that just looks kind of odd. Uh, it will look odd, and hopefully that oddity will kind of um, strike you in your translations as uh, it's, there's something going on there. And if something's dropped off the end, we'll get used to seeing that our three hay verbs could drop off. In the infinitive absolute, it will look like this, uh, oh. So that's one thing we could see um, um, happening with our infinitive absolute weeks. Uh, next up, if we look at our biconsonantal um, verbs, remember these are our verbs that had a weak character in the, B, in the middle, um, middle consonant. So um, bow, to enter into something. Uh, Bet, Vav, Aleph would be an example of this. 
Now, these will show up always with a hole and vav in the middle, regardless of what natural long vowel consonant is in the lexical form. So here, bo simply looks like bo, no problem. If we take our another example, seem, uh, uh, our word for to, to set place to put, uh, uh, seem. Our lexical form would be seem that we'll be looking up, and that would be, in fact, our infinitive construct. But when that is put in infinitive absolute, it will become som. Seem will become som in the infinitive absolute. And all of our biconsonantal root forms in the infinitive absolute will take that holum vav uh, in, their, uh, in that medial position. So if we're seeing bo, well, we'll see bo here. But if we're used to seeing seem, for example, uh, or kum, um, to rise, to rise up, we'll see som or com. So that's one or two patterns to be aware of, but for the most part, our strong pattern pa code will persist throughout the paradigms. So that's a few words on the form. Now let's do uh, kind of the real, the, the real kind of grunt work, but also the interesting work here of looking at uh, syntax. We're going to walk through four predominant types. Uh, again, this is where second year you'd kind of dive in headlong and see what your options are. Uh, we're going to look at emphatic uses, uh, imperatival uses, sequential uses, and complementary uses. And these, again, more or less overlap with Ross, uh, though we'll have some perhaps variation in between uh, what we're talking about here in the textbook. Um, but this will cover most of our basis and give us kind of a, a working syntax to go off of for infinitive absolutes. So let's start at the top. Our emphatic use. When infinitive absolute is coupled with another finite verb, so by finite verb, we mean perfect or, or imperfect verbs so far that we have. Really important, when it's coupled with that uh, finite verb of the same verbal root, so the infinitive absolute and the finite verb have the same verbal root, then it provides emphasis to the verbal action that's being described. Critical here is we have an infinitive absolute and a finite verb, but they come from the same verbal root. Usually in such constructions, the infinitive absolute will come before the verb, but not always, but that's helpful to know about perhaps. But what the point of this construction is, is that the infinitive absolute is affirming the certainty of the action of the verb, that the action will indeed occur. So in your translation, I believe Ross gives you some kind of helping words perhaps to throw down. Um, certainly, indeed, always, uh, those types of things are going to be uh, what you're going to use in your translation to render this in English, since we don't have an approximate form. The example here that we have is one that happens very on in the Hebrew Bible. We're in Genesis 2.17. So let's read through this and then translate it. hada'at tov vara lo tochal memenu ki peyom akalcha memenu mot tamut Okay, so there is our, um, our infinitive absolute uh, right here, uh, second to last word, mot, and tamut is our finite verb. All right, our finite verb there is an imperfect verb. These both come from the, uh, the, verbal, the same verbal root, uh, mot, to die. Um, if we translate through this, um, we would translate something like this. Um eats had at tovara and or probably but here, our vibe is disjunctive, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lo tochal mimenu. Here we have a negative prohibition. You shall not eat from it, mimenu. Why? Ki beyom akalcha mimenu for because in the day you eat from it, and here's where our form comes in, mot tamut, you will certainly die. You will certainly die. This is giving a certainty to the verb. It's not that you, you might die, you may die, you probably will die. Um, the infinitive absolute plus a finite verb is making sure that you know this is going to um, going to come to fruition no matter what. You will certainly die uh, in the mind of the writer. So that's our first use, uh, and an important example of that uh, in Genesis, where we have the emphatic use. Here again, it's that issue of having the same verbal root that matters. So that's type one. Uh, let's move on here. 
Here we're going to look at one uh, that I'm calling an imperatival use, and I think this is something we could kind of put under Ross's um, description of independent verbs, though so he's trying to get a larger category as well, which is fine. Here what we see is when the infinitive absolute stands independently in a sentence, uh, and it inherits the force of a command or injunction, uh, in a sense it's um, doing the job that would typically be reserved for imperative. Now, uh, as we said very early on, the infinitive construct won't quite stand in for a verb on its own. The infinitive absolute can do this in a few different ways. Here's just one of them. Uh, what I like about this one is we have kind of an interesting example, as well as it plugs us into um, a question of kind of development of language, something we've been picking up on from time to time in the last few weeks, interestingly enough, because this usage that we have in this example, the imperatival use, uh, this appears to have operated at an earlier stage in the language where later literature in the Hebrew Bible generally wouldn't use the infinitive absolute for um, imperatives. They would just use simply imperatives. Uh, one of the ways we see this play out is um, infinitive absolutes uh, acting as imperatives, like this sense here, we find that um, somewhat common in the book of Deuteronomy. If we were to kind of chase that forward and see how the Samaritan Pentateuch handles those forms, uh, they're essentially expunged from, uh, from the book of Deuteronomy. So there we get an issue of, I think so far I've talked about the historical development of language, specifically into classical Hebrew, i.e. Masoretic Hebrew. There are other channels you could chase uh, that discussion down into, for example, like this, down into Samaritan Hebrew as well, which is an entire whole other area of study that's crucial for how we understand textual development, um, specifically the Samaritan Pentateuch, which is a very important witness. That's kind of a footnote, um, but it, another example of where language plugs us into larger developments uh, along the way. Um, but back to the topic here, uh, our use that we're talking about imperatival use, we will see this like in the book of Deuteronomy, but we'll see it in um, typically to express divine or prophetic commands or legislative uh, legislative injunctions, for example. Uh, most often it'll, it'll appear first in the clause and it will not have a vav conjunction. Uh, we're used to seeing vav conjunctions at the start of many verbal clauses, so when you see one uh, if it's absolute without one, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing to suggest we're dealing with this use. Well, let's look at one example, uh, not from Deuteronomy, but from Exodus 13, 3 is where I believe this is coming from. Here, Moses is commanding the Israelites about commemorating uh, a very important festival that's inspired by or meant to uh, meant to recall the miracle of the Exodus. So here we're talking about the Passover uh, and, and uh, unleavened bread. Uh, the text reads this way. Vayomer Moshe el ha'am zakor. We're going to come back to that. That's our infinitive absolute. Zakor et hayom. Haze asher yetzatem mimitzrayim beit avadim. So let's walk through that uh, piece by piece. Vayomer Moshe el ha'am. We should be able to do this in our sleep now. Uh, Moses said to the people. There's our uh, vav consecutive at the front. Zakor, remember. Et hayom haze. Remember this day. There's our infinitive absolute. Uh, it's not to remember this day like we would have with an infinitive construct. It doesn't have a vav in the front. It's starting a clause. It's the opening clause of direct discourse, and it's an injunction uh, of legislation. Remember this day. Uh, which day? Well, the day when you came out of Egypt, Mitzrayim, from the house of slavery. So here's an important example where we have a uh, discourse where our, our main verbal idea is in an imperatival sense, but that's achieved by the, in, the infinitive absolute. Uh, so Exodus 13.3, an important one worth a read, uh, and that's just one kind of linguistic thing we can pause on. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's look at the, the sequential use of the infinitive absolute. We've looked at uh, verbs in sequence now a few times. That's been kind of an important thing for us already this semester. Uh, we're going to look at it here again. What we see is the infinitive absolute uh, can take a vav consecutive, uh, and when it does so, it can show action following after that of a preceding verb. Now, there are two infinitive absolutes in this form, in this example. We'll get it um, uh, only one, one use here, and then our final example will kind of unpack the rest of it for us. Uh, 
I like this one from Judges 14.9, uh, and I like it because I, I had a uh, an image here that is linguistically flawed in a uh, in a Bible comic book. Anyways, we'll get that in a minute. The example we're looking at here is from Judges 14.9. So let's read through it uh, and see how we can um, detect the sequence and potentially a problem <laughs> uh, in this image here. All right, here we go. Vayirdehu. Uh, El kapav vayelech haloch ba'akor. So there's a phrase of Judges 14.9. Now the definitive absolute we're going to deal with, at least in this example, is this last one. Ba'akor. So if we were to translate through this, um, it would be something like this. And he scraped it out with his hands. Uh, to, to scrape something out. Uh, and he scraped it out with his hands. El kapav. Uh, with his into his palms, um, and he went haloch walking the akol and eating. So what the um, example here needs me to illustrate is that this verbal action here again. This is we'll get at in a minute. Uh, that's describing one action. He went along and he was eating. Here the point is sequence, much like we saw with our Vav consecutive perfects and imperfects. They're about sequential actions. First I did this, then I did this, and then we did this, and they move on to the narrative. The infinitive absolutes is plugging into that same sequential idea. So when we have a Vav consecutive on an infinitive absolute, it will function sequentially. So having said that, um, as much as I love this image, and I love this, uh, the work I've seen by this, this comic artist, uh, there's something wrong here. <laughs> the point is that Genesis, or Judges 14.9, rather, is saying that when he scraped this, um, this honey out into his hand, um, once Samson kind of got a mitt full of this honey, he ate, not as he sat down, but after a while he was walking along. Uh, so he was eating while he was walking. Um, the point here is that if we were paying attention to the language, um, we get a sense that that's giving us a se sequential action. He didn't just sit down and have a nice snack. He scooped it out, and then while he was walking, he was eating, not sitting down, um, as in this uh, otherwise um, really cool image. So sequence, um, that plugs into an old topic, but a new form that we can use um, to understand that material. Okay, let's finish off with uh, one last example that we already saw some of in that previous example of, of Samson. Here we're talking about complementary action. This is when our infinitive absolute is used to extend the main action of a verb configuration. And most often, uh, that main verb is going to be in the, f in, is in the form of a coupled infinitive absolute and finite verb of the same root uh, to, set, uh, to set some emphasis. So there's two things to note here. And again, this is something similar to I think our type one we just dealt with. But there's two things to note. Uh, in, in these constructions, we often find that halach, uh, to walk or to go, is one of our infinitive absolutes. And it gives a sense of continual action. So uh, our first example is about emphasis. Something will certainly happen. Here we're talking about an adverbial meaning, something that's continually happening. Uh, one of the inf infinitive absolutes will share that same verbal root uh, with a finite verb, and one will be different. So just like we saw in Judges 14.9, uh, the same thing applies here in this example. This is Genesis 12.9. In this example, I would read this. Vayesa Avram Chaloch Vanasoach Hanegba. If we unpack this a little bit in translation, we would say um, our first two words there, uh, and, uh, Abram, he's our subject, Abram journeyed or set out. That's a one noon verb, nasa, to set out, to journey. Haloch venasoach. Now, how is he journeying? He was going, haloch venasoach. He was going and journeying to the Negev. The idea is that he was going on a road trip that involved continuous travel, and quite often we'll see halach giving that adverbial sense here. If we go back to our last example, this might make a bit more sense here. Um, he was uh, walking, vayelech halok, he was kind of journeying along, and while he was journeying along, that's our um, complementary action, vayelech he was eating. There's our sequential action. 
the point that applies here, uh, in one sense, is the same point that applies here. When halach is uh, in the mix of a, uh, or halach as a, an infinitive absolute, is put alongside a finite verb here, nasa, uh, as well as a finite, or as well as an infinitive absolute of the same root, uh, it'll be giving that complementary action. We see this happen uh, um, in these two examples, where when you see halak as an infinitive absolute, that might be a clue that this is the type of uh, action uh, or syntactical use rather that's being uh, applied for the infinitive absolute. So in the same sense that we looked at three or four different uses of our infinitive constructs, here's three or four different uses of our infinitive absolute. Um, all of those things we talked about for how Waltke uh, is describing them at the outset of this presentation, they all apply here. And what I think we've seen is that our biggest syntactical clues for the infinitive construct had to do with prepositions or suffixes. However, for the infinitive absolute, it had to do with contextual clues related to other things in the sentence. That's simply because our infinitive absolutes can't take prepositions or suffixes. So we need to be aware of how they can function alongside of other verbs, alongside of other uh, nouns, whatever the case may be. So hopefully that gives us a sense of uh, what we're dealing with with these forms. Not a full paradigm, but a, a world of syntactical things that we can now start to weigh in, our ba weigh in the balance as we work through translations. So definitely um, have a look at those materials at the end of this chapter in Ross, and we're back together in class. We'll see if we can work on some of those examples.